doing a new run of dates for your one man show, one foot in the gutter. Yeah, so, this is, I mean, I think it might, I don't know if these are the last dates or not, but I know there's nothing planned for quite a while. And this time, I mean, every time I've done one of these shows, every time I walk on stage, I'm like, oh my God, can you believe I get to do this? But this is going to be unique because the last two shows are in Southern California. And the very last show is in Hollywood, on Hollywood Boulevard. And like the people that I talk about are going to be in the audience. And I've already had like a lot of people, you know, already tell me that they're coming. And it's going to be really weird because when I did this show in like Sydney, Australia, or I did this show in Cleveland, you know, I tell all these stories and people are like, wow, you know, that's crazy. But when I'm in Hollywood telling the story, it's like people calling me on there. I don't know if I can swear or not. But sure, um, go ahead. Okay. When people, if I'm in Hollywood, people are going to be calling me on my shit. You know, like if, right. if I'm talking, I'm talking about Cat House or I'm talking about growing up on the Sunset Strip, looking out of people that also did. So it's when I talk, tell these stories in, in, in all these different places I played, they're very enamored in the whole Hollywood scene. But when I do it in Hollywood, it's people not only that were a very big part of the scene, but people that I'm talking, it's like, you know, talking about, you know, me and Tammy in the old days and Tammy's right there or, or in Hermosa talking about drugs and porn stars and my parents are there. You know, it's like it, it's going to be very, very interesting. And yeah. the other thing that I think I'm I'm a little bit nervous as far as the Los Angeles show goes is for people that don't know, um, most bands don't like to play L.A. Because the truth is, and I'm even guilty of this sometimes, in Los Angeles, when you go see a band play, people just sit there like this with their arms folded and they're like, yeah, okay, you know, sure. and nobody goes nuts. It's like I went to a concert last night in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the crowds are ballistic and they're going crazy and they're making noise. And in my opinion, I don't care where you're from. That's the way you're supposed to go to a show. When you go to a show, you yeah. make noise, you scream and yell, you have fun, you get excited, you turn up the music loud driving there, you, you get into the whole thing, whether you're at a club with 300 people or at an arena. And in LA, it's like, okay, and knowing all these people, and this is probably going to be the show that's going to be filmed when we haven't filmed the show yet. So it'll be interesting if I say certain things that are funny and do get a good reaction in Hollywood. And even weirder is going to be telling some of these stories where people know like, oh, I know he's talking about this person. And hopefully they won't be those people that shout it out because, uh, you know, the good thing is, is saying things when I was on tour and people were like, oh my God. But regardless, there's a lot of stuff that the people in LA are going to have no idea about. So that's why I'm, I'm, I love doing this, you know, and I've got eight more shows and this is just the best. Well, it's unabashed, right? It's, it's completely pull the veil up and just tell the fucking truth, right? I mean, that's, there's, that's you anyway. There's a lot of things in this show, you know, people think it's just like, oh, and then on Headbangers Ball, we had Megadeth. It's not like that. I mean, I talk a lot about stuff that happened before Headbangers Ball, a lot of stuff that happened after Headbangers Ball that people had no idea. And a lot of the show is funny because we get to laugh at ourselves and some of these things we relate to. But there's a lot of the shows that people are like, really? Like, you know, people don't know about my, I mean, not the drug addiction, but the selling drugs, the getting arrested, the going to jail, the times that I've lost everything and been completely like not like broke, but still in a house, like broke. My power got turned off. How am I going to get money to do anything selling my vehicles? You know, that wasn't that long ago, you know? So there's a lot of stories about that. And of course, there's a lot of the stuff, you know, I found some footage that people have never seen before. And I'm very proud of the show. You know, anything that I've ever done, sorry to give you such long answers, but of That's all the fine. things that I've done, you know, if you went to the cat house, I don't believe you went to the cat house to see me. If you watched Headbangers Ball, you didn't watch Headbangers Ball because I was on it. You watched because you wanted to see the guests where you were going to see who the video was, videos are. And when I do this show, people that show up are to hear the stories that I'm going to tell them. And that was something that was um, kind of hard to realize when my whole career, I know that I'm not the star. It's all these bands. It's all these 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 things that are going on at the Cat House or Headbangers Ball or any of the TV shows that I've been on. And this is, it's very cool 
to know that people are showing up at these shows and they're doing really well. I mean, I sold out Sydney. I walked out on stage on Sydney in Sydney, Australia, sold out. And I was like, yeah, and you guys got Headbangers Ball. And they're like, no, I'm like, you didn't even get Headbangers Ball. They're just like, no, I'm like, why are you here? You know, because because I just, you know, in L.A., everybody knows me from Cat House pretty much. And just that ass on the street. But it, it's just interesting to see what works in all the different states or even countries. It's good to see you out there. I went to your event uh, in Irvine, the Cat House of the 2015. Ugh. And, uh, you know, there were great bands there. You know, uh, Tammy got up with you and you sang. You got to you got to jam with the all star band Ace Fraley. I mean, the, the lineup was incredible. And I think what we a few of us, at least myself, left going, I wonder if he's going to revive that or are we going to hear more about this, you know, uh, but it's good that you have the show out. Yeah, the truth about the Cat House Live Festival is that was the first thing that I had ever done. I mean, anybody that knows me knows that I'm a control freak. You know, I do when, when it came to the Cat House, I ran everything except for the opening days, which, of course, I couldn't have done any of this without Tammy. But as I became more obsessed with the business side, I designed the flyers, I promoted, I hired the staff. And it's the same thing with my show. When I did the Cat House Live Festival, I joined forces with Live Nation, which was not just me getting a partner. It's me like somebody grabbing me and telling me this is how it's going to do and removing bands that I wanted on the show and putting other bands on, you know. I was not as much as people love the lineup. It wasn't my idea lineup, even though it was a great show. Mm -hmm. And I just I mean, to the point of, you know, even showing up and I wasn't on the guest list to get in. I mean, it's that kind of thing. <laughs> no, right? really. there was a lot of there was a lot of stuff. But, you know, as much as I think of the negative, people tell me what a great time they had at that show. And that should be my takeaway from it, because if I say, oh, this didn't run right and this wasn't, then it kind of discounts the people that went there and they had a good time. And it was really fun. And and the reason that I liked doing it was I liked seeing old people and the thing that I really, okay, when I say old people, I mean old people that I knew. I don't mean old people. Now I do these shows, I just see old people. Yeah. But um, it, it was good getting acquainted. I mean, in Hollywood, in the mid 80s, late 80s, early 90s, there really was a camaraderie. And even though all these bands were different, we would go out a couple nights a week to support each other's bands. So you'd go see Guns N' Roses, you know, one night, then you go see Faster Pussycat the other night, then you might go see, you know, whoever else the other night. You know, it was it was it was real camaraderie that we don't have anymore. And it does not exist. I don't know if it exists anywhere. It doesn't exist in L.A. Have you been down to the strip lately? I have, and it's just, it's, it, I mean, yeah. I don't know how else to say it. it. It's, you know, if I say it was a shell of what it, what it used to be, that's an understatement. The strip right. is, I'm sorry, the Sunset Strip is dead. And if anybody yeah. wants to say, oh, Ricky, you're old and out of touch, might be true. But I still go see new bands. I go to shows all the, I went to a concert last night. You know, I'm always going to shows and I like going to small clubs to see bands as well. And the Sunset Strip there's nothing cool about it. You know, you've still got the rainbow and the rainbow is fun. But, you know, when we used to go to the rainbow in Hollywood and we saw Mario and of course we lost Mario, but you had Michael and Tony at the door and, and there was this familiarity there. And it's it's nothing. There's nothing like that. And in my opinion, what killed the Sunset Strip was mm -hmm. when they stopped letting people pass out flyers because then you had no reason for people to be on the Sunset Strip. The Sunset Strip was magical. There was just, you know, thousands of people there at nights. And, uh, you know, there's there's nothing anymore. There's nothing. I still remember the jingle for Gazzari's. Hi, this is Bill Gazzari, the godfather of rock and roll. If they ain't sexy, what do they say? If they ain't Foxy, Foxy. Guys, they ain't getting on my stage. <laughs> you know, like that was, to me, being old the golden era of the strip. I mean, it, and, and you got to take it further. I, I was just going to say, give you some props for Headbangers Ball because Thank you. I know there were a few VJs on before you took the helm, but when I go to a big show like in the Inland Empire or Orlando, or when I see or hear about a show like in Rio and there's 300,000 fans there to watch, Iron Maiden or some underground band that wasn't necessarily promoted by MTV, but by getting a fanzines, the Headbangers Ball, 
And I think I just wanted to say, I, I think you were a very, um, very instrumental in that. It's th- thank you. I appreciate that. And I always, I've had so many people say, dude, thank you so much. You turned me on to Pantera. I was like, thank you. But I, I didn't pick the videos. You know what I think I did is, and, and the one thing that I really want to stress is, you know, when they saw me on Headbangers Ball, that was my first time on TV. I'd never been on the radio. I'd never done anything. Like that was my first time doing anything. So I was very awkward and uncomfortable. But luckily I had had relationships with all these bands prior to being on Headbangers Ball. So, you know, if everybody wanted me to be on Headbangers Ball and be the serious like, oh no, we have the latest from Slam, but see all serious. I'm like, no, I'm a goofball. I'm going to do goofy things because I know these people because I'm doing these things with these people, you know, when this cameras aren't on, you know, and and sometimes I, I, I run into people that I don't even realize were part of these stories. You know, last night I went to go see the band Cold Chamber play and the singer, who's also the singer of Devil Driver, Des, you know, he's like, dude, I remember when I was 17 and you gave me a job at the Cat House and we used to bring sandwiches to Axel Rose. And I was like, oh, my God, that's right. I gave you. It's like there's all these bands that I don't realize that my life's intertwined with that. You wouldn't even think nobody would think the singer of Cold Chamber was the bar back at the Cat House. You know, it was just like, yeah, it was so much stuff. And and I, I kind of hate getting up there and saying, well, my friend's this, my best friend's this. Because then it seems like I'm going to be saying that everybody is my friend. But these are all people I knew way before I was on TV, way before I was on radio. They were just people we knew from the scene, you know. And it's it's just funny how many people intertwine throughout the story. And I'm very grateful for that. It's, it's so cool. I bet. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just your arc, your career has been, you mentioned something about hitting bottom without that big bottom you had back in the eighties with drugs and alcohol. I just want to say you, you you talk about your vulnerability a lot, you know, you show your ass, you're not afraid to say, Hey, I, I messed up here. This is what I did. But I remember a period, uh, you know, you were on 97, one KLSX and dude, it was coming undone. I was driving for a living and I was going through a divorce. We're getting personal. And you were too, or you were going through a, bre- a breakup. <laughs> and I'm going, I got to turn this guy on at 3.30 or 4 or whenever it was. And you were like that voice, you know, on, on the radio. It's like us, when we were kids, the transistor radio, that was our friend, right. 93 KHJ or whatever it was, right? Yes, yes. Totally I remember like being that. a little kid listening to KHJ and calling up to win like I once won a hundred dollars when I was a little kid on KHJ and went and bought a skateboard. My mom's like, how can you spend a hundred dollars on a skateboard? But um, the, the thing with the talk radio, which I, I enjoyed, but I had all these inner demons and there was never a filter. And I would always talk about all the stuff that I was going through on the radio, on the triple R that led to the big demise that ended up in a fight in jail. And, and I talk about that in detail in my show and that's another thing that's going to make the LA shows unique is because people might remember when I was on the triple R remember when I got in that fight and went to jail where if I tell that story anywhere else nobody I mean anywhere else I've 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 played God so many places but nobody knows some of those stories because it's not the type of thing you promote like oh yeah and he went to jail for beating up a DJ you don't talk about that kind of stuff but in my show, I, I I don't want to say that there's a message because I don't want to sound preachy, but there is a message that, you know, that I that I do say in the show that any good thing that's happened in your life wouldn't have happened if you didn't go through those bad things that set you on the path. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, I had a radio show that was syndicated nationally for 20 years where I was talking about rock and roll and talking about racing. 20 years I did that show, made me a lot of money. And then it ended. And then a month later, I started putting together this spoken word show and this tour. Now, yes, my finances really tanked after I lost that radio show. But if I didn't lose that radio show, I wouldn't be talking to you right now about going out on tour. I mean, I will I will tell you this. I say this every time. Whenever I get to say I'm on tour, I it blows my mind that I get to say it. We they I just saw the proof of the tour shirt that I'm playing. And last night. I saw the Guar show also, and I was with my wife and we were looking at the shirt on the back of this Guar shirt. And I'm like looking at all those dates and she counted all the dates. 
And she goes, do you know the dates on that tour shirt is the same amount of dates you have on your tour? I'm like, wow. Like when I'm done, I would have played 37 shows. And that's like a real tour, you know? Yeah. But I'm doing this so bare bones. It's like I sold my car and bought a minivan. So we're driving to all these shows. It's like the first day we have to drive 754 miles. One of the days we drive from from Dallas to Tucson, it's 954 miles. And just me and two other people. That's our whole crew. Because, you know, I'm coming on to this. It's like I'm coming on headlining shows, yet I'm a brand new band that's never put out a song. So people don't know what it is. So I don't have money or budgets or record label support. So it's very challenging, but my God, it's so much fun. I bet. I was just going to liken it to being in that Econoline van. You're up and coming, eating bologna sandwiches and selling merch and just barely making $12 a day. But, you know, and you're but you're out there, you're in the element. And here you are. You've done a lot in your career. But to have that kind of, I'm just going to say it's like humility. Like, hey, I'm just glad to be here. Oh, you have no idea. And think of all the people, you know, you will affect with your story. It'd be nice if that's the case. I mean, um, it's when people tell me that they like the show, because this is something that I just sat down and write. I mean, the first show I ever did in Charlotte was way over three hours. And I was like, oh my God. And now it's, believe me, I cut at least an hour off that, okay? But it's still a long show. And it's just me talking. And to know that people dig it, it's like, you know, I'm not a comedian, but there's very funny parts in the show. And when I say something and a lot of people are laughing, that makes you feel good. But when I'm talking about certain things and there are these pauses and you could hear a pin drop, that is that would be like a band plan getting a standing ovation. You know, when, when, when people are signed, they're really listening to you. I was like, wow, this is really, really cool. And you know, about the humility, you're right. Because for people that don't know when bands play venues, they all get a percentage of your shirts, which really sucks. So, you know, almost every, every single club I've ever played, they take a percentage of your shirts. So they get, might get 20%. And, you know, I don't get a percentage of the bar. They don't help me pay for the shirt. So if the shirts don't sell. So if you wonder when you go to a show and your t-shirts are 40 bucks, now you know why. Because I have to. And and I try to, I've always, you know, I've had this apparel company forever. I've always tried to keep my prices reasonable. But venues take a percentage, which sucks because there's not a lot of markup in merch. No, I don't think there is. You need a manager like Peter Grant to go in there and just like <laughs> put the screws to him. It's no, different right. now because because as much as I would like to say, look, this is how I'm doing these shows. You're not taking a cut. The, the, they don't. Sometimes I don't even know if clubs care about shows. I think they're just like, OK, here's going to go in. This is what's going to come in. This is what's and they're not even into it. Um, there are exceptions like, you know, the machine shop in Flint, Michigan. There are exceptions, probably like the bourbon room in Hollywood and 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 uh, I've played some clubs that have just been so incredible that, that, that the owners are so into it that even if it wasn't a big ticket sales night in, in Knoxville, Tennessee at the concourse, and they were talking about how much fun they had, you mm -hmm. know, there's people that are into it, but it's, it is sometimes just a business. You go to these clubs and you never meet the owners or promoters. You just do the best you can. For our audience, would you give a, you know, we, we've talked about it, but would you give an overview of the show and maybe include some of the dirt, you know, like, I mean, I, I think the meat of it is that you and Tammy started the cat house yeah. and it was the best. It's where all the musicians went after their show because all the girls were there. Uh, I'll let you take it from there. I grew up in Hollywood. Um, you know, I remember have, I don't talk about it in my show, but I remember having a moped and delivering strips on the scripts on the sunset strip when I was like 16, 15, and I tried to go the band route like everybody else. And I played in a couple bands. And then in my scene, as we created this place that was a rock and roll dance club. And in our small group of friends, they just happened to be Tammy, Axel, Slash, Duff, all these bands, which were nobody's really at the time. Guns N' Roses had a good buzz, but they didn't have a record. And so when all of a sudden, as these bands are getting bigger, they're helping elevate the cat house. And you mentioned Bill Gazzari earlier. I was the complete opposite of Bill Gazzari. I wasn't a promoter. I didn't try to talk about all the foxy chicks at our club. It just happened because I'm just some guy that's just, you know, 
it's it's said in the metal years that me and Tammy opened the cat house just to meet strippers and get free drinks. That's the bottom line. That's really why it was was open. And yeah. we lived in a different time and a time of sleaze and debauchery and raunch and roll. And some of the stories of things, whether it's whether it was Vince and Axel or Axel and David Bowie or some some of the stories that so many people have heard or, or seen in documentaries or read about in in books. Some of those stories happened at the cat house. And I know exactly what happened because I was there. So while I am telling stories that some people hear, I'm giving the perspective that they don't know. And yet there's other people that that were intertwined in the show that they never, you know, nobody's going to expect to hear. I don't want to give some of the names away, but there's people that are in these stories that they're never going to expect to be in the show. And so I took the cat house and, and, and helped build it to a pretty big club. Yes. With a lot of help from my friends, and then when the MTV thing helped, Axel pretty much set up the audition and flew with me to New York to audition. And so it was like all these people, all my friends are becoming the biggest rock stars in the world and helping me. But on the same token, I was always like the guy back here while they were all the biggest rock stars. And then they helped me with the Headbangers Ball. And I got a little bit of a name from that. And I also talk a lot about Headbangers Ball. You know, I have some footage. You know, it, it seems like no matter where I went in the world, uh, the most popular episode ever of Headbangers Ball was actually Alice in Chains at the water park. And I found footage that's never been seen of that. And so we talk about that. And then we talk about the the sex, drugs, rock and roll and losing it all and having it all and the crazy changes. And, you know, I'll look at what I think the scene is and being an older guy going to new shows and seeing new music. And there's, there's just so many flavors of the show and it's hilarious. And I, I sound weird saying it's thought provoking, but I'm just trying to say the reviews because I feel weird telling you like great reviews from me because it sounds like it's the greatest talk show. It's this, this, this. that's oh, go on, say it. But it, it, it's <laughs> I, I love the show. I mean, yeah. you know, I used to watch what Henry Rollins did. And he was like the goat to me. Henry Rollins was like, when it comes to spoken word and storytelling. And then I figured that a lot of people really didn't even know it. Like my story t spoken word was. And yes, Bruce Dickinson's have been very successful with it. But my show is a little bit different than that because there is a multimedia effect. Because there's parts in my show where I'm sitting in my room with a record player discovering heavy metal and discovering rock bands like it's not like a play but i'm like taking people back to where i was when i was a kid discovering music going through oh look at this this is this record and and talk about going to school and being a rocker and all these different aspects of life and and yes it is my life as it intertwined through all these different things but i mean knock on wood it's 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 bizarre to me but there has not been one bad review. I mean, the only people that have ever said anything negative about my show were people that weren't even there. So I'm used to that stuff. I get haters all over social media. I'm fine with that. But to read that people go to my show and like it, and even more amazing is to see young people at my show, to see people yeah. in their 20s at the show. And and that is just like, and that they're still interested, you know, that maybe they weren't even part of the rock scene. And it's just, uh, it's just, it's great. So, so you, you come to the show, you sit down, um, we sit and talk and make eye contact. And I just talk about all these stories and I try to bring the viewer along with me. And I've got eight shows left starting in New Orleans, going from New Orleans to Houston, to Dallas, to Austin, to Tucson, to Phoenix, Phoenix is going to be crazy because Phoenix is the only place that I brought the cat house to. I did several cat houses in Phoenix and then we go to Hermosa beach and then we ended all in Hollywood on August 13th, which I think there's like 10 tickets left. So Hollywood will be sold out probably by the time you're watching this right now. So uh, it's, ex it's exciting. And I, you know, I do these things like VFIs, which is what we used to do at the cat house and, you know, 12 people show up and a half an hour before the show, we hang out, we just sit at a table and talk. I answer any questions you have. We take pictures, sign posters, they get a t-shirt. And it's not like the meet and greet where you go and you pay all this money and you go like click and then you walk right. away. It's like, we're sitting at a table. It's only 12 people. And we just talk for half an hour. And I've been doing those at all the shows. And, you know, I, I'm not going to say who, but I talked to somebody that was telling me how much he hated meet and greets. I'm like, you do? I go, let me tell you something. The reason that I do these, these VFIs, which is sort of a meet and greet. The reason I do these before the shows is because it puts me in the best mood. 
you know, to go out and, and I know this sounds like such a cliche, but to go out and meet these people that are excited about being in the show and talk to them. And then I got to go backstage, sit back and get ready. I'm like, I'm ready to go. I got excited because I love doing it. Anybody that has ever met me at a place, if you see me somewhere and you come up and talk to me, I love it. I am not somebody, as long as I'm not eating food, by all means, I hate it when people say, oh, I saw you at this place, but I don't want to stop. Please say something. It's the, Anytime somebody recognizes you and you're as old like me, it feels really, really good. So go to the show. Everybody get your tickets to go to the show, please. I think you're just... Uh you're still pumped full of youth with this. I, and I think it's the music. I think, it, I really think it's a, it's more like a 14 year old, like you could be in a 60 year old body, but it's what you think. And I don't know. I, I argue with people. I say, you know, rock is rock is not dead, but yeah, if you go to an industry show in LA, it, yeah, it's, it's a lot of this, but if you go to the Inland Empire, San Bernardino, or if you go to oh, Chicago, yeah. Florida for the Welcome to Rockville show or one of those big festivals, they're off the hook. They're crazy about their shine downs and their, you know, whoever the priest is there. I mean, people, people just are, are crazy. And, and I think you're synonymous with, you hate that word hair metal. But I'm going to use that. I'm going to say that you're Ricky Rackman, Headbangers Ball, that era from even though I don't think you got on the ball to what, 87? No, 90. Oh, OK. So we, we had you had downtown Julie Brown. You had some people who were Kevin C. C. Williams. Curry. Everybody tells me they're like, why? I mean, I, I did some fill in things like as a guest host in 89. But for some reason, everybody says, dude, I used to watch you on TV on the 80s. I'm like, doing what? Like, nobody realizes that I was on from, as the host, I was on from 90 to 95. Started the first week in January in 1990. But I was on from 90 to 95. And most people don't realize that. So when Faster Pussycat and Guns N' Roses and everybody was getting Jane's Addiction, everybody was getting their record deals, I wasn't even on Headbangers Ball. So that's like a big misconception that people have all the time, which is okay. But just the same, Cat House. You uh, hit the wall with the dope and the drink in 88, right? Yeah. And it was probably a blessing, you know? Oh, I'd be dead. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, there's a lot of things. Like, it's funny you talk about, like, still being youthful, but being in a 60-year-old body. It's like, you know, people are like, you know, you look so stupid getting a mohawk at 60. I'm like... You guys got to understand, I have always, my entire life, done whatever I wanted and enjoyed it. And I've always, you know, I, I mean, I just recently broke my arm skateboarding. Which is <laughs> See, you're, stupid, stupid. Is that a nine inch or t that's a ten inch? That's a big bowl board. Your 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 Alba skate right there. Oh, the Alba is one. But this is one. This oh, okay. is the one that I just. I bought this brand new, so stoked, and then and, oh, and right right right. I skated in the pole. Yeah. And, uh, I, uh, I broke my arm and, and I'm sore all the time, but it's like, you know, and, and about being, I, I hate the word hair metal, but even though I'm, the crazy thing is I am synonymous with some of those bands, even though, I mean, this, this pissed a lot of people off. Like, you know, everybody's like, oh, you should be on a Monsters of Rock cruise. I'm like, I like like a handful of those bands a lot, but it's, it's not really my scene, even though I know I'm thought of as that scene. Like when I go to shows, like I'm booked to be on the Headbangers boat. Now the Headbangers boat, I could not be more excited about, even though there's very few people my age on it. But I'm friends with a lot of the bands on that. It's like I have always loved Skid Row and Slayer. You know, I always have. I've always, you know, my favorite band is Motorhead, always has been way before Cat House. But I've always liked heavier stuff, but I've always liked, you know, there's no reason I can't listen to Cinderella and Lamb of God. And I always have, you know, I went to go see, you know, Mudvayne and Cold Chamber last night and I might go see, you know, Jason Isbell. It's like I just I love going to shows and I like the excitement and, you know. I, I'm very proud. Of course, there's Tammy, who who's, who's still to this day, Tammy is my very best friend in the world. I talked to Tammy more today than I did probably back in the day. I mean, when was the last time you talked to Tammy? Yesterday. But still, it's pretty cool that if people associate me with a band, like people might associate with other bands, or you know, maybe it's Eddie Trunk might be associated with Extreme because he's friends with all those guys. And uh, and by the way, if that's not the band it associates, I'm not throwing shade on Eddie because Eddie's great. 
but um it's pretty cool that the band that I'm associated with the most is Guns N' Roses. So it's like, well, that's kind of cool. You know, when people say like, oh, yeah, well, he's friends with the Guns N' Roses guys. I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. At least I'm associated with like one of the biggest rock bands in the world. I like that, you know. And they broke. You huh? guys broke. You broke. They broke at the same time at 87, 86. I think a lot of it. A lot. I think I really think and I have no problem admitting this. You know, I really think that my success and I think that the house that I live in now and the cars and the motorcycles that I have and the great life that I have, I'm the first one to say, I don't know if it would have been the same without Guns N' Roses because they have always been helpful. Even to the point like, you know, Guns N' Roses plays Charlotte and Slash is wearing a cat house shirt, the same kind of cat house shirt that Axel wore in 1988. It's like those guys, they've always like, they've kind of looked after me, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. and not to the point, just like, they're always, they're, they're there, not Axel so much. I haven't talked to Axel in decades, mm-hmm. but Slash and Duff especially. And, uh, you know, it's nice that I'm associated with that band that, you know, people don't associate me most with a band that's just not around anymore, you know, but yeah, mm-hmm. by the way, and I do hate the word hair metal because there wasn't a band that ever went to the cat house that when you asked what type of music they played, they said, we play hair metal. Nobody said hair metal was made by somebody that diminishes a great music scene by how big their hair was. I'm sorry. Cinderella to me was like kind of almost as good as Aerosmith. Not, I mean, they're different, of course, but they were that good. And to say that Cinderella is a hair metal band, to say that some of those old albums from Skid Row are just hair metal bands. Bad Seamstress Blues and tell me that. Oh my God, what a great song. And Slave and Grind by Skid Row. That's a great song. And Tamey, I believe, even though I never use the word underrated, because I think that's a stupid word too. I don't think people realize what a great songwriter Tamey is. It's like, so if you were to say that those bands are hair metal bands, you're diminishing a really powerful, great, music scene and i just to me the word hair metal means that there's no substance behind your music you you're just known for your hair and there were bands that you know they you know people like oh well how come these bands people don't listen to these bands anymore it's like because it sounds dated it is dated it sounds dated yet there's still bands that are playing it's like oh you know the hair metal scenes really Iron Maiden still sells out arenas, stadiums, and they've never, ever stopped. And they're just as good now, I would say, as they were, you know, but it's just like certain things change. Everything changes. And if you're caught in a whole fashion trend and look, you know, and at what point are you not, is Motley Crue a hair metal band? Or after you've sold 5 million records, are you not hair metal? You know, Poison still sells a lot of seats at concerts. You know, but I don't know. I, I, to me, it's always been just rock and roll, you know, and, and yes, I listen to heavier stuff, but I listen to everything. I just listen to stuff that I believe is true and pure and not contrived and not made up for sounding like something else. Right. Not a flavor of the month, but a perennial thing. That's even if they did a total doo-doo on the mixing board, if you were a fan and you love them, you go through those generations, you know, there's still- unless unless the band gets very successful and then you don't like them anymore, which is the stupidest thing. Come homogenized and boring and, and like yes. all the other cookie cutters and they're shitty to their fans. And it, it's it's all part of a package. You know, the funny thing is, is like people find out pretty quickly how rock stars treat fans. You know, and I put myself, I don't put myself in the rock star category. I put myself in the fan category. I learned a valuable lesson and and Tammy helped me with this. I remember seeing a certain band and I'm not going to say who he is, but he played a show solo as opposed to being the big band that he's in. He played a solo show and there weren't a lot of people in the audience. And he started giving shit. Why the hell aren't people showing up? So I talked to Tammy. I'm like, what do I do if like I do a show and there's only like 30 people there? He's like, you kick ass on that 30 show. So I had a show in Knoxville, Tennessee that had sold like about 30 tickets at a, at a place that fit like 600. And I was like, well, first of all, I shouldn't have been booked in a place that fit 600, but 30 tickets. And the agent that I was, my agent said, 
it's probably better if you cancel the show. And I was thinking about it. I was like, yeah, but what about the 30 people that bought tickets? You know, what about those 30 people? So I just went out there and it was in Knoxville, Tennessee, and it ended up being probably 50 or 60 people. It wasn't a lot of people, but those people that were there never wrote reviews saying that there were a lot of empty seats. They all talked about how much fun they had and how much fun I had. So it's so important that no matter what you do, you you make sure that every person standing there walks out like, hell yeah, because you know what? These days, people are lazy. They don't want to go out. So you got to give them a reason to go out, you know? And I, I mentioned Maiden before, which is funny because back in the ball days, I wasn't the biggest Maiden fan. But I've seen them recently, not recently, in the past 10 years, where every time I, I see their show, it blows me away. So when there's an Iron Maiden show, I don't care where it is. If I have to jump on a plane, I'm going to go to see it. Mm -hmm. You know, bands need to give that type of performance that it's the type of thing that if they're playing, you don't want to miss it. You don't want to think, well, I'll just see them next time around. That You need to be part of that experience. And some bands don't remember that, and they just go through the motions and collect the check. And most people know who those bands are. But some people just bust their ass to have a good show, whether it's 50 or 15,000. I think that's a good way to close. Well, no, a good way to close is telling everybody how to buy tickets for my show. The dates start August 2nd, right? I'm going to have to put my old man glasses on. And um, the first show, I'm going to read you the dates right now, and I'm going to have to read them, is August 2nd. I'm at the House of Blues in New Orleans. Then August 4th at the House of Blues in Texas. August 5th, a matinee show in Austin at Come and Take It Live. August 6th in Dallas at the House of Blues. Then August 8th, the Rialto in Tucson. August 9th, the Marquis in Tempe. Then August 11th in Hermosa Beach at St. Rock. And August 13th in um, Hollywood, on Hollywood Boulevard. And the like the biggest venues I play, I, I like, and the truth is, like when I see venues that are like five or 600, I'm like, no, because the first show I ever did was in Charlotte. We did sell that many seats and it was cool, but it's, you know, I like playing venues. Like it looks like the capacity is like 200 because mm -hmm. then I know it's going to be crowded. And then I can look at the person that's sitting in the very back of a 200 club. And I want it, I want people to go to the show to feel like they're just kind of hanging out with me and talking and telling some stories. So I've never played a show bigger than a 500 seater. And I wouldn't, I mean, if all of a sudden I came back into these shows and they became very, very successful and I'm selling lots and lots of tickets, I would have way more fun doing three nights at a 400 seater than one night at a 1200 seater. Cause I don't, I mean, for me to say, I don't want to play big places because I can't sell enough tickets to play big places, but I'm still selling, you know, 400 seats a night. And, and considering the only way people are finding out of the show is think, I thank you for this, but also my social media, you know, there's really no advertising for these shows. So a lot of it's word of mouth, but I just, I just love playing. I really do. I mean, I played, I played venues that were about 125 and had a blast, just a blast. And the draw, of course, is that intimate experience with the person who's going to the show. I mean, there's, you're reaching the person in the back, you're right there making eye contact with the whole crowd of people. Yeah. Like if I'm sitting up on stage, I get distracted easy. If I'm on stage talking to somebody and I see somebody on the phone, I'm like, dude, put your phone away. Like I like I get so distracted. I love that. Oh, I love I, that, that I always that that is a big thing that I do yeah. is um I find it very insulting. And I also don't want people filming the show because then people will know what's going on. Right. And, uh, you know, there's a part in the show where I say, okay, everybody bring your cameras out and we'll, we'll do some fun pictures of me on stage. I'll take some pictures of you. We'll have fun right at the intermission. But then I say, put the phones away because, you know, these days we are so distracted with everything and I'm guilty of it as well. But I want you to put your phones away and I want you to just sit back and have fun. If you need to talk to somebody, go outside because I don't want to see the light. Somebody next to you probably doesn't want to see the light. And that's why when I go to shows, yes, I have a fairly big social media following. So I like to take a picture of the show and maybe film a little bit of it and then put my phone away for the whole night. It's like, I don't get what these people are doing filming for 20 minutes. It's distracting. And it's like, experience it with your eyes. I don't want to look at your phone to see a concert. I want to go take in this band. I want to go see like, 
oh my God, look at this. There's the guitar there and I can see and I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the whole show coming around me. I don't want to stare at a little glass screen. So I, I, I like it when people put their phones away during the show. It's, it's, I want people to experience it. It sounds like a great experience. I'm looking forward to seeing you. I'll be good. Seeing Which you. one are you coming to? Uh, it'll either be Hermosa Beach or Hollywood, whichever one the publicist sets me up with. <laughs> good Hermosa. Yeah, you know what? Because that's my, those are my digs, and I'll show oh, you that it is a six hundred, <laughs> six hundred no, six hundred capacity. Well, the thing is, the thing that I that I've done, and the reason that maybe I'm that the, the numbers are wrong is. I'm on all the off previous yeah, I'm shows, on the on the previous shows, they're all seated. I made people put seats in the whole show, and from what I understand, some of these sheets shows aren't seated. But when you take like a three hundred sitting three hundred or four hundred club, and you put seats, it cuts it down a little bit. But right. I, but you know, usually if you're in a band, you don't want seats. Well, I'm up there for a while. I want people to sit down. You know, in Atlanta, when we played in Atlanta, we sold out, and we brought all these fold out chairs. Because I just I don't want people to have to stand up and squirm. I want people to sit back and and take it all in and and share the ex sounds so cliche share the experiences with me. Yeah, well, yeah, it's going to be an experience. Uh, it's going to it's going to be nostalgic. It's going to be funny because I know you're funny. Um, Thank you. So and you don't take yourself so damn seriously either, which is God no, I can't. Yeah, why would you? You know. I'm a 60 year old man with a mohawk. <laughs> exactly. Who breaks his arm skateboarding? God bless you. God. Yeah. And it hurts. It's Everything hurts. Everything hurts. Yeah, I know. It's hard. I'm a 60 year old guy without a mohawk, still skates, still surfs, and still goes to metal shows. And uh, here I'm making it about me. This is not my interview. This is Ricky. No, Matt. we're we're sitting having a conversation. We're relating. People yeah. like this stuff. But I love going at, at the end of the show and being able to maybe talk to the guitarist or talk to the whatever personality and, you know, and, and just say, Hey dude, I, you know, I remember you when I was 13, you know, it's like, like, Hey, you're Joe Perry. You're Joe Perry. Yes, I am. You know, I'm not worthy kind of thing, but I just love the whole rock thing. And I'm enamored by, yeah, that era, the eighties, you know, that's my jam. And that's when punk exploded you know, in the, in the seventies and, and in today's, and you were, I know you were part of that thing. That's a whole another chapter and you'll probably cover a little bit of everything. I'm sure the show. I cover, a very, I cover a very little bit about it. And there's some funny people that nobody would have ever guessed was my friend or my friends that got pretty big in the punk rock scene. I mean, I still, I still love punk rock and I still have friends that are in some of the bigger punk rock bands, but I like it. You know, I like, I like everything, you know, I like, you know, I like everything, almost everything. There's certain yeah. stuff I don't like, but I don't need to talk about that right now. Off the record, maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah, I appreciate your time. Thanks for calling Thank in. You. Um, yeah, I'll uh, I'll see you out there, hopefully. More yes, and definitely make sure, like, if you talk to Kelly or whoever it is that's setting it up, make sure that, you know, you come back and say hi and so we can talk after the show. I certainly will. All right, Good. Really. All right. Thank you. And send me the link when you post it so I can repost it. Sure will. Thanks, right, buddy. Brother. See you. See you in a couple weeks. All right. Bye.